Number five, the title is The Role of Attitudes. Uh, welcome, dear friends, to this further diagram on chemical addiction. The topic is The Role of Attitudes. And I begin once again with my familiar ski slope on the hill of progression into alcohol addiction. One out of ten persons starting the drinking habit will show the symptoms of this addiction. It may be the extreme pleasantness of the high produced by this central nervous system di uh, drug that hooks this one and induces him to return again and again to this high. Moving through gulping his drinks and sneaking extra drinks due to his increased tolerance, he may also come to a point of being tolerant of blackouts, the loss of memory while using the drinks. The point of no return comes with the LOC, loss of control. The most common pattern for us in the USA is the loss of control over the amount of alcohol consumed, what is usually referred to as a bender or spree pattern. The person intending to have a few drinks ends up having a few too many. With this result will come the usual social complications of aggressive behavior, family discord, drunk driving arrest, accidents, and so forth. There is a pattern of drinking addictively which involves drinking every day. There is no abstaining in this person, but neither is there any staggering drunken behavior. This pattern is more like that seen in the person addicted, say, to pain pills. My sister did all of her drinking at home in this second pattern, but she went into full-blown DTs when a health condition put her into the hospital. As the problems with the uh, loss of control over the amount of drinking takes place, we find that family and friends may gain an understanding of the disease and what is happening to a loved one, and then intervention is possible to force some response from the addicted person. In this particular diagram, I'm showing that attitudes that both parties, both the individual with the drinking problem and those that surround them, play an important part in the hopeful recovery of the alcoholic. What do I mean by speaking of attitude? I use two phrases to define attitudes. One is to call it a mindset. The other is to see it as a habitual thought pattern. From birth onward, all of us come under many influences. It is usually our family that have the biggest part to play in developing our mindsets and our thought patterns. But today we have a lot of competition from television, movies, music, and peer groups. From my diagram, you can see that I am linking thinking and feeling and action to the attitudes as I have defined them. By attributing attitudes to either a positive or negative position, I am assuming that we learn to like something or to dislike it. The little boxes at the base of these figures of attitudes, plus or minus, refer to this idea that these are very firmly held. Using this idea of the mindset, then I'm saying that like in concrete these attitudes are set, 
and it may very well take something like a jackhammer to get them moving. The C balloon attached to the attitude symbol refers to the conduct which flows from that attitude. Keep that image in mind as I proceed to discuss changing attitudes. Here is an example of what I am suggesting. Out of all the words possible, I choose one. Spinach. Now every one of us knows what spinach is. It is a green leafy vegetable and it is supposed to be good for us. Yet we may have memories of our mothers placing some of this green gooey stuff next to the hamburger and potatoes and telling us, eat it, it's good for you. Today just the mention of that word is enough to make us a little sick to our stomach. Maybe we do also have memory of the Popeye cartoon and how Spinach would make Popeye super strong so that he could take on and defeat Bluto, but it never did that for us. I'm building a case that for many of us we would have a negative attitude towards this vegetable spinach, and as a result our conduct toward it would be to reject it. If we would be going through a cafeteria food line today, we would say no thank you to the spinach, I'll have some of the peas. Now my wife Nancy, and through her influence some of our children love spinach, even such an unusual thing as a spinach sandwich. You may get the idea you don't have to think long and hard about our attitudes. Just a word, just a smell, just a, a, a melody, and we can be moving toward it or moving away from it. My purpose in this talk is to attempt to motivate people to be open to changing their attitudes that are, are many of them are harmful and even hurtful which we are holding on to. What is needed is to be able to, what is needed to be able to do this? How do we change our attitudes? Looking at the three letters in the word how, the H stands for honesty. Self-honesty is a must. The O in the word stands for open-mindedness. If we are not open to be willing to learn new things, nothing will change. And the W stands for willingness. Some personal cooperation is a given, and it can be expressed as want power. And the question, how badly do I want something? Before we take a look at the three words that concern us in looking at alcoholism, allow me to mention that between the notion of positive and negative attitudes, there may be a neutral area of fact or truth. In the changing of attitudes, the mind's ability to accept this neutral fact may pave the way for the change that we are looking for. For example, even though our early experience with spinach might have been the one that I described earlier, yet when we are married and we have a mother-in-law who uh, prepares spinach with a lot of bacon and uh, other spices uh, and many spices, that, that we have learned to like it in that particular form. And so that once was thought as a solid attitude has already begun to change. The first word that uh, I would like to call to your attention is the word alcohol. Now, one who is into a problem with the using this drug, chemical will have to choose your favorite form of, of it. It is the substance that gives us the high that we've learned to love. 
and for us it can sometimes seem like it is a luscious nectar. Now let me tell you, you don't get much more positive than this, luscious nectar. So the attitude that we begin with, that or have learned to uh, come to, is this one of a very positive attitude, luscious nectar. Yet at the same time, it is the substance that getting us into all kinds of trouble. The problem drinker must take another link at what he is consuming because as long as he continues so highly positively about the drink, he is going to want to have some. It is not the boogeyman approach, I think, to inform him that the part of the drink that produces the effect in him is really a central nervous system depressant. Its effect is to depress the brain area. Now when the area of the brain that controls our inhibition is depressed in the early stages of consuming, we may begin to act much more freely and so we interpret this as our being stimulated. Yet if we continue to consume more alcohol, we will eventually go to sleep, eventually pass out, go unconscious. One of the dangers of teenage drinking is that they are largely not very highly uh, familiar with the, the chemical, and they may at the very stage of about to pass out drink a large amount and as a result their, the drug continues to anesthetize the brain and death can possibly result. The person with more experience in the drinking practice may drink enough to pass out but has done so at one drink at a time so the total brain is not ever affected. So to learn something about the drug alcohol can have a person moving from the very highly positive attitude to the neutral area. But that one in ten who has progressed to an addictive use of alcohol may need to come to a negative realization about it. I use the word poison in my diagram. Now that may sound like the boogeyman approach to some of you. In my symptoms and phases first diagram, I do mention the fact that a drug salesman has told me that when a company develops a new chemical and has been put into use, they expect that 7% of those who use it will experience a negative or allergic reaction. I said then that that 10% in those developing addiction to alcohol come fairly close to that figure. Maybe the recovering alcoholic would be correct in reporting to others, I'm allergic to it. After all is said and done, the truth is, that this person needs to begin to know and accept a no-use attitude towards all alcohol drinking. That attitude change was from a positive to a negative. The two other words that I have chosen to deal with may well be in the opposite direction. Take the word alcoholic. I suggest that most people will find that word as applied to anybody, by anybody, to them as totally unacceptable. He would rather die than to call himself an alcoholic. As long as this attitude continues, he will have difficulty in behaving like a recovering person. To share your story at an a Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, the person begins by saying something like this, My name is Joe and I'm an alcoholic. 
and the entire audience responds, Hello, Joe. My dear friends, the sense of comradeship and affection shown in the fellowship of AA is amazing. Worldwide, a man or a woman has instant friends by attending an AA meeting or visiting an AA club and making that simple announcement about being an alcoholic. But the honest truth is that it has probably taken some long time of effort on the individual's part to get to the point that they can be comfortable doing that. The neutral position with this word alcoholic is to begin to see that alcoholics are like everyone else. They are human beings with all that that designation implies. In the course of these talks I have several times mentioned that alcoholics are not bad, immoral, or stupid people, but they have a rather baffling disease which they have been struggling to control by willpower and personal effort. The addiction is not going to surrender to either willpower or personal effort. The loss of control, the LOC, will be there until the person admits to themselves and to others that they are a sick person. Victory can come through surrender. A negative attitude towards this word alcoholic can in time become a positive of attitude of accepting the reality of being a sick person with certain actions and conducts possible to tend toward health. My third word is alcoholism. I would suggest that the attitude shift needed here would follow the pattern of the word alcoholic. It is very negative in the beginning. It is a label to be avoided at all costs, and one that person will have a difficulty in putting on himself. The neutral point in the shifting of the attitude may be to look at the drinking pattern as a problem, maybe even a most serious problem. The phrase that AA uses with step one, admitting that life has become unmanageable because of drinking, that is a pretty good description of what most of us would call a problem, life unmanageable. It might be said at this point that what I am describing as a problem and accepting these words and diagnosing the person's drinking problem may not be limited just to the person himself, the, the addicted person, but may include those closest to him also. I remember that the nurses in a mental health ward who would announce to their alcoholic residents, all right, party boys, it's time for your lecture, are not helping that person in accepting their illness, their disease. To accept the medical diagnosis of the disease of alcoholism is a sign that this person has changed a negative attitude into a positive one. The resultant conduct in this person's life now means that he is willing to do whatever is necessary to maintain a sober lifestyle. Health insurance companies will pay for treatment for this disease, so they see it as more than helping someone overcome a bad habit. Society's low willing, slow willingness to accept the disease concept may be a contributing factor to the low success rate in this type of treatment. A lower bottom for individuals is needed to be reached before a positive life change is made. Progress is slow in coming. I now call your attention to the pyramid on my diagram. 
I am suggesting that building up from one's attitudes, these up and down experience that began with our birth, that they continue to create the positive and negative end, that there exists a connection to these attitudes, to our value system, and then from them comes the, the things that hold our interest. And finally, they determine what we actually do, determine our behavior. Most of us seem to be waiting for a bolt of lightning to penetrate to our attitudes for any change to take place in our lives. We seem to be uh, the victim. We seem to be so powerless. And sometimes uh, with conversion experiences and the like, something like this will happen. There are other ways to produce some of these changes. For example, from someone I got this statement, that it is easier to act our way into a new way of thinking than to think our way into a new way of acting. Do you see what we are facing? As long as our person has the wrong attitudes toward what he consumes, why he consumes so much or so often, and why problems cluster around his consumption. And as long as he thinks that he can stop any time he really wants to, the illness continues. But if he would act as if he was an alcoholic, that alcoholism was his disease, that alcohol was an allergic substance to his system. And in acting as if he stopped drinking, attended AA meetings or other support groups, added other positive props and did that long enough, he might have truly acted his way into a new way of thinking. Attitudes are very important in the recovery process. Reasonable people have to be have an honest look at his or her situation today and ask the hard questions about themselves in these important aspects of life. And with the help of friends and family, to make those life changes and to keep them going in that direction. Remembering that uh, we can have that conversion experience, but that sometimes it is easier to act our way into that new way of living than it is to always try to be convinced in our mind and then feel that we will make the necessary changes.